Republican candidate for president Nikki Haley is pro-vigilante. On Tuesday night, Nikki Haley called on the governor of New York to pardon Daniel Penny. That's the 24-year-old Marine veteran charged with second-degree manslaughter after placing a homeless street performer into a 15-minute chokehold. Penny is white. Jordan Neely, the dead man, black. New York City coroner ruled it a homicide. Thank you, Nikki Haley. Thank you so much for contaminating the jury pool. What could be more presidential than politicizing a murder trial? Why don't you take Kyle Rittenhouse's virginity while you're at it, if you want to suck up to the white nationalists? Now, flip the script. Had it been an African-American Marine who placed a white homeless man in a chokehold, Nikki Haley, would you be calling on the governor of New York to pardon the black Marine? Of course not, because you're the former governor of South Carolina. You had to take the Confederate flag down over the state house, kicking and screaming. This is Nikki Haley, who wants to be president of the United States. She's a former governor of South Carolina, Trump's ambassador to the UN. And uh, she thinks it's appropriate for a presidential candidate to opine on a criminal trial before all the facts have been entered and the evidence weighed. Nikki Haley, of course, pro-life, but let's pardon the, the white Marine who puts an African-American in a chokehold for 15 minutes and kills him. You know, you had to weigh in on this, Nikki Haley. You just couldn't let the process play out. As a presidential candidate, you felt it imperative. You had the moral responsibility to weigh in on this specific case of manslaughter. I wonder why. I wonder why. Abortion becomes illegal after 12 weeks in North Carolina on July 1st. That's after the Republican-controlled state legislature overruled a veto by Democratic Governor Roy Cooper, seen here on Tuesday. He vetoed the bill, but it was, it was uh, overruled by the state legislature. The name of the bill is the Care for Women, Children, Families Act. It allows for abortion... Uh, past 12 weeks only in cases of rape and incest up until 20 weeks. Then you have to have the baby. The use of abortion pills is now restricted to 10 weeks. Can't use the abortion pill after 10 weeks. And Governor Cooper, Democrat, Governor Roy Cooper says the new bill rolls back women's reproductive rights 50 years as planned. Last year, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, deciding the issue of abortion should be left to the states, not to women, the states like, you know, North Carolina and Texas. Second term Colorado Congresswoman Lauren Boebert has officially served divorce papers on her husband. The 36-year-old far-right congresswoman calls herself a Christian nationalist who opposes same-sex marriage. Bobert opposes the teaching of sex education in our public schools and wants to stop the federal government from funding Planned Parenthood. She also obviously opposes abortion. Two months ago, the 36-year-old Lauren Bobert announced that one of her four sons was about to make her a grandmother. He is 17, and he's about, I think he just had the baby, 36-year-old Grandma Lauren Boebert, Congressman Lauren Boebert, who doesn't want sex education taught in our public schools. Boebert was 19 when she had her first child with her soon-to-be ex-husband, Jason Boebert. Jason Boebert, who was convicted of harassing and physically assaulting the congresswoman the same year she gave birth to their oldest child. In 2004, Jason Bobert, Lauren's soon-to-be ex-husband, also pleaded guilty to public indecency and lewd exposure 
after he was arrested for exposing his penis to two women, one of whom was a 16-year-old minor, while he and his wife were at a bowling alley. Jason Bobert served four days in jail and was placed on two years probation. These are good people who should be moralizing about transgender children and the LGBTQ community. Later that same year, the same year that Lauren Bobert's husband was arrested for exposing himself to two women, one of whom was a 16-year-old minor, Later that same year, Lauren Boebert, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, did I mention she's a Republican? Later that same year, she was arrested for third degree assault, criminal mischief and underage drinking after she attacked her husband and trashed his apartment. Well, she could trash an apartment just by walking in there because she's trash and her husband's trash. Lauren Boebert, Congresswoman, Lauren Boebert has been arrested for reckless driving and interfering with police officers as they try to stop minors from drinking at a concert. They had a handcuff her because she was telling underage drinkers to run away, run away from the police. But we back the blue, don't we, Lauren Boebert? She is also one of Washington, D.C.'s biggest proponents of the Second Amendment, refusing to go through the metal detectors installed by Speaker Nancy Pelosi after January 6, which uh, Lauren Boebert was all for. I believe she referred to it as 1776. Up until recently, Boebert and her idiot husband owned a restaurant called Shooters in Rifle, Colorado. There's a Rifle, Colorado. I'm assuming it's right next door to Bulletproof Vest, Colorado. The name of the restaurant was Shooters, where waitresses were encouraged to carry sidearms. Sexy. These are the people we want carrying weapons. Lauren Boebert can't wait to be photographed at a gun show brandishing an AR-15. How many times does Congresswoman Lauren Boebert have to get arrested before those red flag laws start kicking in? The woman and her husband are allowed to carry weapons. Don't we have red flag laws? But of course, Republicans will say it's not about the guns. It's about untreated mental illness, like Lauren Boebert and her idiot husband who exposed himself to a 16-year-old. He showed his penis to a 16-year-old at a bowling alley, no less. Uh... I won't say that, but uh, no. Um, uh, This is untreated mental illness. As though Bobert and her husband, whose neighbors are constantly calling the police on them for speeding, uh, not being able to control their pit bulls, as though the gun-toting Boberts are capable of any self-reflection and are able to say to themselves, you know what, I need a mental health professional. They need mental health professionals. They should be red flagged. They should not be allowed to carry weapons. They have serious mental health issues. 36-year-old grandma? She's a 36-year-old grandma opposed to teaching sex education, and she's going to lecture the LGBTQ about same-sex marriage? This is clinically insane. She should not be allowed to carry a gun. This is the same woman who signed onto a congressional proclamation trying to make the AR-15 America's national gun. You know, with all that's going on with the shootings right after Uvalde, Lauren Boebert signed on to a congressional resolution to make the AR-15 America's national gun. You are the national loon, Lauren Boebert. You're a sick person. Your husband's sick. He exposed himself to a 16-year-old girl at a bowling alley. But to be expected from people who are degenerates politically, you cannot separate the politics of these people 
with their personal behavior. You know, yesterday we talked about Rudy Giuliani and the latest charges against Rudy Giuliani. A former staffer yesterday filed a, a, a lawsuit in Manhattan Supreme Court accusing Rudy Giuliani of sexual assault, making her perform oral sex while he talked on the phone to Donald Trump. She said Rudy was constantly gobbling Viagra and wanted violent sex. Well, that's everything you need to know about the Republican Party. Guys who are angry because they can't get it up, and when they can, they want it hard and mean. She says Rudy is an alcoholic. Gee, what a surprise. What a surprise that Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump's lawyer, is an alcoholic. Every single book written about the Trump presidency describes Rudy Giuliani as reeking of whiskey. The woman in this lawsuit says Rudy starts drinking in the morning and continues throughout the day. And now we're learning from this lawsuit that Rudy, desperately in need of cash, plotted to sell pardons from President Donald Trump for two million dollars apiece. This is Trump's lawyer who was all over right wing news last week calling E. Jean Carroll a liar. Rudy Giuliani calling E. Jean Carroll a liar. Like I said, you cannot separate degenerate politics from the degenerate people who foist it, foist these politics on us. The Republican Party is run by degenerates, people who want, if, they're, if they can get it up, they want violent sex, they love their guns, which are, you know, it's cliche to say this, that penis substitutes, and yet they're the Christians. They're the deeply religious ones giving us lectures about who we can love, how we can love. These people are loveless. Their whole platform is hatred. And they're talking to us about same-sex marriage and the LGBTQ community. I don't want to get advice for the lovelorn from people who love guns more than they love women or men or themselves. Deep down inside, these people hate themselves. They know they're worthless. They know, as Hillary Clinton said, that they're deplorables. Last year, Lauren Boebert was narrowly reelected by fewer than 600 votes. Think about that. Her constituents know everything about the Boebert family, and yet they still voted for her. Can't just blame the Republicans. Can't just blame the Republicans. You got to blame America. We are just getting word that Joe Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, has a national security problem of his own, specifically inside his home and keeping people outside his home from coming inside. The Secret Service said late Tuesday night it is looking into how it was possible for someone to break into Sullivan's home in the West End neighborhood of Washington, D.C. two weeks ago. Yeah, we, we should launch an investigation to see how such a thing was possible. Jesus Christ, the national security advisor can't even keep his own family secure. The Washington, Washington Post reports that an intruder was able to get into Sullivan's home despite round-the-clock Secret Service protection. Secret Service agents had no idea the security perimeter had been breached until the intruder left the home and Sullivan came running outside to inform them. The intruder was able to escape undetected and was reportedly drunk and confused. So Secret Service agents naturally assumed he was just one of them. Since the start of the Biden administration, Jake Sullivan has been national security advisor. His job is to keep people from breaking into our country. Maybe this isn't the guy who should be advising us on Ukraine and how to stand up to Russia. Well, 
Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned this week that if the debt ceiling crisis, which is completely manufactured by Republicans, uh, she warned if the debt ceiling crisis isn't resolved immediately, the federal government will run out of cash later this month. Welcome to the club, federal government. So Joe Biden has canceled his scheduled visit to Australia this week, partly to resume negotiations with Speaker Kevin McCarthy, but mostly because Air Force One won't be able to afford the fuel to fly him back home and he'll end up stuck in Australia like Sinatra in 1974. The country will be broke and Air Force One won't be able to fly out of Australia. And Biden would be stuck there. It'd be funny if it were Trump and not Biden. Democrats have introduced a resolution to expel Congressman George Santos, Republican Congressman George Santos, after Santos was indicted by the Justice Department on charges of wire fraud, money laundering, and lying to Congress about his financial disclosures. Really? George, Congressman George Santos, the... The newly elected Republican congressman from New York was indicted? That's, well, I don't think we should expel him until he has his day in court. He's a United States congressman. Nearly 12 Republican members of Congress have called for Santos to step down. 50 House Democrats sponsored the bill, which would require a two-thirds majority to expel him. Santos... Santos called the indictment, quote unquote, a witch hunt. Gee, I wonder who taught him to say that, to call it a witch hunt. By the way, Santos was one of the congressmen who signed on to the resolution making the AR-15 America's national gun. He joined Lauren Boebert in uh, trying to make the AR-15 our national gun. After a three-month Absence due to shingles, 89-year-old California Senator Dianne Feinstein returned to the Capitol. Talking with reporters, Feinstein appeared confused, insisting that she never left Washington, D.C. and has been casting votes inside the Capitol all along. She obviously has the advanced stages of senility, uh, which is why she's serving in the Senate. The Senate comes from the root word senile, senescent. It's for older people. That's, that's true. That's what, what the word Senate means. Uh, you're supposed to be old and wise. Uh, look up the Latin root of the word Senate. It's related to senile. House Democrats Ro Khanna and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez have called on Feinstein to resign, and I think that's kind of cruel, and I'm not being sarcastic. The woman has one more year left in office. I think that's cruel to call publicly for her to step down. You know, we've got so many doddering old white men in the Senate propped up by their staffs. It seems unnecessary, uh, unnecessary to publicly call for uh, Dianne Feinstein's Resignation. Do, do it behind the scenes, Ro Khanna. I like AOC. I don't like Ro Khanna. His wife is worth close to $200 million, and uh, he trades all day, sits and trades stocks for his family all day. A, yeah, a new Microsoft research paper says artificial intelligence can now reason like a human being. According to the paper, scientists provided AI with a series of puzzles that could only be solved by what Microsoft defined as human ingenuity, which requires a keen understanding of the physical space around the artificial intelligence. The Microsoft research paper says AI was able to do this, suggesting that science is getting dangerously close to creating Artificial intelligence that can surpass the efficiency and speed up, go faster than the human brain. Microsoft researchers stopped short of calling their artificial intelligence sentient, 
Last year, Google fired one of their top researchers who stated publicly that Google's version of artificial intelligence had become sentient. He suggested that Google's version of artificial intelligence had a sense of self-awareness. So, you know, it's not going to be a Republican. <laughs> you know, it, unlike the Boberts, uh, we have some artificial intelligence that is uh, perilously close to self-awareness. And along with self-awareness comes a survival instinct, which could end up pitting humanity against the machines. All humanity uh, has a survival instinct. And uh, so if you have self-awareness, you're going to want to survive. Uh, it's going to be cool. May not be climate change after all. Maybe the Republicans... <laughs> All right, maybe we're all, maybe we're all going to be destroyed by self awareness of the machines. Maybe Bobert's right. Maybe maybe Republicans are right. It's self awareness that's going to get us all killed. Meanwhile, <laughs> Sam Altman, he's the CEO of OpenAI. He testified before a Senate subcommittee on Tuesday and warned that his product, OpenAI, needed to be regulated by the government. As Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, and all the big tech monopolies spend billions to develop artificial intelligence, Altman told senators there is potential that something could go horribly, horribly wrong. Altman said AI will eliminate many jobs while creating new ones and warned that AI was making it way too easy to spread misinformation on social media and the Internet. I got to tell you, I'm not married, but now's a great time to cheat on your wife or your husband. That's artificial intelligence, honey. That is, those, are, those are not my text messages. I did not send that pic on my phone. I did not send that pic. That is AI. This is the golden age of adultery. That's what... <laughs> Artificial intelligence is ushering in. Elon Musk, seen here at a party with Ghislaine Maxwell more than a decade ago, that is Elon Musk with uh, Jeffrey Epstein's girlfriend and procurer, Ghislaine Maxwell, who's currently doing time. Elon Musk has been subpoenaed by the Virgin Islands in its sex trafficking case against J.P. Morgan Chase, they're charging the bank with aiding and abetting Jeffrey Epstein's abuse of underage girls on his private island inside the U.S. territory of the Virgin Islands. J.P. Morgan Chase head Jamie Dimon will testify later this month. Prosecutors want Musk to turn over any correspondence between Musk, Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein, or J.P. Morgan Chase to better determine whether Jeffrey Epstein recommended Elon Musk as a client to J.P. Morgan Chase. They wanted to determine how much J.P. Morgan Chase benefited financially and or turned a blind eye to Epstein's sex trafficking. Hmm. There were elections here in America on Tuesday. As Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny said yesterday on my show... Other countries like Turkey and Thailand had their elections, uh, but they held them last Sunday so everyone could vote. You know, if you want everyone to vote, as Howie Klein said, you hold the elections on a Sunday. But here in America, we hold our elections on Tuesday to make it harder for the working class to take time off and vote. Sherelle Parker, seen here, won the Democratic nomination for mayor of Philadelphia which means she will be elected mayor in November since Democrats outnumber Republicans seven to one. More news coming out of Pennsylvania. Democrats have retained control of the Pennsylvania State House after Heather Boyd won a special election for Pennsylvania's 163rd State House District. Republicans currently hold the majority in the state Senate, 
had Boyd lost the house seat, uh, then the entire house would have been turned over to the GOP. Pennsylvania's newly elected Governor Josh Shapiro is a Democrat. The special election was called after Democrat Michael Zebel gave up his seat amid accusations of sexual harassment. And Democrats on Tuesday night flipped Jacksonville, Florida. Florida, Florida uh, journalist Donna Deeg- Deegan was elected mayor of Jacksonville, Florida. In a runoff election, the outgoing mayor was term limited, and he is a Republican. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. It's time for, thank God, it's fraud. (laughs) Dr. Harriet Fraud, the beloved Dr. Harriet Fraud joins us. She is the host of Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head. She's a psychotherapist who treats patients using the prism of our economic system to explain most, if not all, of our neuroses uh, as stemming from capitalism, which makes us sick. Yeah. You were sick. I, I yes, just found I out that COVID. you had COVID. Yeah, I had COVID. And I, you know, our country is pretending that we don't have COVID anymore, even though a thousand Americans a week die of COVID. And so I started looking up the figures. Wow. We have 4% of the world's population, 14.5% of the uh, world's COVID cases. We've had a million dead. China, which has a billion and a half people, have had, what is it, 100, I wrote it down, 120,961, so about 121,000 people dead. Wow, we've had over a million. Right. <laughs> And so, you know, it's we don't care for life and nothing's more apparent in our not caring for life than the level of violence and murder. We've right. had 172 mass shootings just this year, 136 days, 172 mass well, shootings. Let's, let's get to that in a second, because I we my listener and I, we love you and we care about you. Are you vaccinated? Yeah, triple vaccinated and everything. And the myth about the vaccine that the Republicans spread is it's supposed to prevent COVID. The vaccine mitigates COVID. It makes it uh, doesn't make it makes sure that it, you don't die from it. So Just how right. how how was your COVID? Horrible. I was completely knocked out for days and, you know, only partially alive. It was terrible. It was just terrible. And, you know, even though I had three vaccinations, it was just terrible. I hadn't had it before. I'm usually super careful, but, you know, I got it from my husband who got it from somebody we ate indoors with when it started raining. Right. When you say it was horrible, uh, you were... I felt like I was dead. You know, I all I could do is rest and drag myself around. I'm usually a very energetic person. Yeah, yeah. I'm really interested in a whole lot of things. I was interested in sleeping. Right. <laughs> it, right. It was awful. It was a dead existence. Right. And how many days was it horrible? Five. Five horrible days. Yeah. We spoke a week ago. You didn't have COVID. No, I didn't. But when I got it, I got it. You know, with a huge blow, it really was a huge blow. And even today is the first day I start doing my workout again, really. Well, so not to be a Pollyanna. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. But this is proof that if you get vaccinated, you will you will have a there. You will get COVID there. You still have to be cautious but it will not kill you. It'll be five of some of the most difficult days of your life. That's right. But, That's right. And it, you, didn't die. you didn't die. And was it the five most horrible days of your life or was it just like a bad flu? No, it was, it felt like I, 
did when I had pneumonia as a younger woman, just completely depleted. Right. Dragging myself around. <coughs> yeah. You know, I couldn't be interested in anything. But you knew what it was. And so you were able to just sleep and say, this will pass if I if I take care of myself. That's right. right. That's right. I could say, you know, just lie down. Your body's saying you've got to rest, rest, drink juice. Right. Have soup. Okay. Right. So get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. When they right. introduced the vaccine, they weren't sure whether or not it would stop the spread of the disease. When they introduced the vaccine, they said, we are certain that it will uh, alleviate, make yes. it less lethal. Nobody lied. It's science. Mm -hmm. We don't know everything about these yeah. vaccines. All we know is that if you get COVID and you're not vaccinated, you're, you could die. So speaking of death, the shootings, there was another shooting. Uh, well, it goes without saying, and there'll be another shooting tomorrow yeah. and another shooting tomorrow. And then the day tomorrow, after tomorrow, tomorrow right. how many? Yeah. Tomorrow and tomorrow creeps at this petty pace. How many uh, uh, shootings are going to be necessary until we ban assault weapons? Well, I don't think it's the number of um, shootings. They've had 172 this year out of the 136 days we've had. So they certainly have enough. But we'd have to start looking at the confluence of events. First of all, they're all men who are shooting. The only woman who has shot anybody um, in a mass way was the woman who shot up the Con Covenant School, who was a trans woman aspiring to be a man. So she was kind of en route. And um, I think, you know, American men are in terrible, terrible trouble because, first of all, women were in charge of relationships. And without relationships and without connections, people go crazy. We are pack animals. We need connection with each other. And when women are separate in relationships, when they leave a relationship with a man, they still are connected with their children and their families. Men tend to disconnect. And that's terribly dangerous. Plus, men used to have more stable relationships because they were the economic support of the family. And women needed men in order to support, in order to live. No more. And so that um, men can't support women. They want women, they need women to go out and work. In addition, they expect to buttress their failing manhood that women will provide the housework, the childcare, the emotional care, the social hookups of them and their friends and their families, and also the emotional understanding of them as people. In addition, men used to have standing on their long-term jobs. Now, the four biggest employers are all on the clock. They're Walmart, call centers, fast food, and what is the other one? Temp? No, temp not, work. Temp, not temp workers. Well, I'll think of it before the end. Um, I have it. Emily Bindelsberger. Uh, oh, yeah, and Amazon. How could I forget? Right, right. Amazon. And so, and all of those are on the clock. You have no dignity. You have a certain amount of tasks to complete anything. And if you don't, you start getting dinged by, you know, ding, ding, ding. You're getting dinged right now. Yeah, no, forget it. But, um, you know, it's that you are part of a machine. And the machine goes off if your task isn't done. Mm -hmm. and you have no dignity. And you also don't have a way to be promoted. And you don't have a position in your community. Now, if you're part of a union movement, you have some connection. And that's important. And more and more people 
or in unions, even white collar people like the residents, the medical residents, <coughs> the nurses, museum workers, academic, the whole academic establishment, the 48,000 people that you know, who work for University of California as teachers' assistants and um, teachers and adjunct teachers and lab techs, and they are increasingly organized because they have to be, and that's a hope for people's mental health because they are connected around something they believe in. But they are a minority. There's a Writers Guild strike. I'm a member mm -hmm. of the Writers Guild. The show could not be done if but for that union. Uh, it provides me with so much luxury that everybody is entitled to health care. I, I don't mm -hmm. have to don't have to worry about health insurance. Thanks to the Writers Guild. I have one criticism of the Writers Guild, and it's a criticism I have of every union in America. There seems to be a lack of class consciousness in my union. I belong to several unions. They, they tend to identify with their oppressors. Every union does. Can you have class Consciousness. Can you have strong unions without class consciousness? You know, I get these magazines from SAG-AFTRA, from the Directors Guild, from the Writers Guild, from the Producers Guild, from the AFL-CIO. But the AFL-CIO is actually a little better at enlightening its members to the plight of all workers. Mm -hmm. it, it, it feels like the entertainment industry unions need to get back to uh, at least reading about the salt of the earth. Uh, right. And caring, about, pretending at least to care. And also about knowing that there are, there are really two classes in the United States at the moment, the employer class and the employee class. And they better connect with the fact that they're in the employee class. And I think they are doing that in the residence union, nurses union, and right. so on. Even intellectual workers are doing that at the universities and at the museums. The Writers Guild needs that. Right. So without is class struggle, what, what, what is a union without class struggle? Nothing. A union is a recognition that you're being ripped off that in the capitalist system, it doesn't pay to hire you unless they're making more off you than they're giving you. Otherwise, you don't make a profit, don't hire someone. And so <laughs> it, I was discussing this with a friend and, and I said, I have no problem with somebody being rich. I have a problem with their being too rich. I think we should ta there should be a cap on how rich you can be. An excess you know, profits tax yeah. issue the way there is in other places. I have no quarrel with somebody working hard and saving their money and being able to live, quote unquote, better than most people do. I have a problem with them leaving it to their children. Mm -hmm. They should, you know, I, I think there's a problem there. They should be able to leave some of it to their children. I understand playing the game, being competitive and wanting to, to rack up numbers and prove to yourself that you're something. I mean, it's sad that somebody has to do that, but I understand it. And there's the accidental byproduct of prosperity and work for the masses if the government gets a handle on it. Uh, what I do have a problem. I'm sorry. It isn't. There isn't one city, state, or county in the whole United States where two minimum wage workers can afford an apartment or right. two bedrooms. One in 14 Americans has a period of homelessness. You can work hard, but you're not paid enough to save anything. And, the, and everything is stacked against you. So social security tax is a tax on incomes up to 160000 you have to pay so you can get something back. Well, why does it stop at 160? That's crazy. Yeah. 
you are taxed on everything that people without a lot of money might have, a house, a car, right? But not stock and bond wealth, where most of the wealth is held? What? That's crazy. No, it's not. Those yes. who play the piper here make the rules, as you can see. You know, Clarence Thomas is friends with Harlan Crow, so he votes against abortion because Harlan Crow doesn't want him to vote for abortion and so on. That it's a it's the best democracy money can buy. Right. And guns are a great example. People are slaughtered all over the place, not only the mass murders, but just because they got into an argument, they got in front of somebody, they turned in the wrong driveway, they knocked on the wrong door, and someone shot them through the door. And why? Well, the NRA is tax-free because it's listed as a 501c3 nonprofit, and it makes millions from lobbying. And Letitia out- James, our attorney general, is going after them. Yes, because she has integrity. But, you know, what are we doing? These people are bought and sold. <coughs> and in the best money, the best democracy money can buy, the lobbyists from the NRA with their multi-millions from the gun manufacturers can allow, can continue the slaughter. Guns are the biggest cause of death of children in the United States. Right. Let that sink in, folks, while the, the doctor takes a sip of water. The number one killer of children in America, guns. Right. Not car crashes. No. Guns. Not COVID. Guns. And most of the children that are shot are shot in domestic disputes and angered by their parents. But that, and yet we will not stop guns because there's too much money to be made. And they say it's a mental health issue. Well, a lot of people are mentally upset and they're not shooting people. Right. You know, it, it it, it, we, we talked about this last week on the show. Yeah, we did. And mental illness has nothing to do with somebody snapping and going out and shooting people. We right. all snap. We all have tempers. Mm-hmm. If... Uh, I, I'll throw uh, an ashtray against the wall. If there's a gun, uh, you know, we reach for the, the thing cl- closest to us. Uh, I like to think that if I had a gun, I wouldn't use it. I know I wouldn't, but some people don't have impulse control. No, they don't. And they're used to shooting as a sport. And also, because they feel embattled, because their lives are being taken away. Their jobs are lousy. Their future is lousy. Their country has betrayed them. Uh, You know, one in 14 has a period of homelessness. What kind of country is this that does that? Well, they and they want to defend themselves. So they want a military style weapon to defend themselves against a government that's letting them down. And that's what the NRA espouses. Be a man. Take control with your gun. That's right. why it's an all-male thing, this mass killing. And why I marched with Mothers Against Guns. This must have been a, a Mother's Day 10, 12 years ago. And mm-hmm. I loved the idea. It was on Mother's Day. It was Moms Against Guns And the idea was, how can you argue with moms, especially if you're a Republican? I'm not blaming women. But it seems like somebody needs to get the message to these men that brandishing a sidearm makes you look impotent, it, it, that, it, that, you, that you're telegraphing to the world I can't get it up. I can't get laid. I I don't feel good about myself. I need this gun to imbue me with power. Yeah, and yet the media has just the opposite thing. It has the opposite message. 
as Clint Eastwood, make my day as he's about to shoot somebody in the head. Yeah. You know, that you have power. There's a very good film called Grand Canyon with. Yes, uh, uh, Steve Martin and uh, he's in that. <laughs> very famous black actor who's wonderful. Yeah, um, from San Francisco. <laughs> yes, that's right. And in it, there's a scene where this truck driver comes to pick up a truck. Is it Lawrence Kasdan? Did he do, did he write no. and direct that? Maybe he looked, maybe he wrote yeah. and directed. Yeah. But um, and he comes to pick up a car that's been called in as stalled, and the car is surrounded by a gang that is going to take this nice car and perhaps shoot the guy who owns it. And he comes, he's black, and the gang is black. And he comes out and he says, look, let me take this car or I'll lose my job. You know, I got nothing against you. I got respect for you. And the head of the gang said, yeah, would you respect me without this gun? Right. You wouldn't, you'd run right over me, wouldn't you? Right. This gun gives me respect. And I think that is so in our country. And I also think that there was a map by the Wall Street Journal juxtaposing insecure masculinity and gun ownership, and they were perfect match, those areas of in male insecurity, which means the most testosterone, creams, penis extenders, all that stuff, that there's a way of selling guns as an emblem of manhood that I can take care of myself when, of course, you can't. You're out of control and then you shoot people. But the media won't cooperate with your message. And it's, a, it's very sad because the mass of the American people want gun control and our ostensible representatives won't do that. Well, Michael they, Bloomberg, uh, the reprehensible mayor of yeah, New, York. Uh, New York City, uh, founded every town USA. Is that any town USA, which is which he's failed at? This is yeah. he. He said he was going to use instead of paying his fair share of taxes, he was going to fight gun control, and he put together the greatest minds, and he's paying top salaries for every town USA. I think that's the name of it. And they exactly. take out they take out ads and say things like. Every day there's a mass shooting and he's got billions of dollars. Why doesn't he hire ad busters out of Canada, which created Occupy and mm -hmm. start doing real ads that show the link between impotence? Uh, if you buy a gun, you're more likely to buy a uh, erection That's cream. cream. Right, because you're not going to get it up. Right. That would be very helpful. But that hasn't been done. And what has been done is a massive lobbying effort buying our representatives to vote against any gun control, no matter how many people are slaughtered. But they used that to do that with cigarettes. They, they used to show guys with voice boxes and holes in their throats. They still do it. And they yep. say, I used to smoke. And then they would take a puff through their neck. And they're pretty impactful messages. Really? I don't understand why Michael Bloomberg can't spend a billion dollars buying television advertisements that say, when you buy a gun, hi, I'm so-and-so, I bought a gun to protect my house, I accidentally killed my six-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. And just keep running that as, uh, as ads. That would be helpful. But then you'd have to counteract with billions of dollars that the gun manufacturers pay and the lobbyists are given to persuade America that guns enhance your masculinity and give you a chance to protect yourself when you feel unprotected because Americans are unprotected. Yeah. And yeah. so, that, you know, there's the capitalist angle that if you have the money, you can buy anyone, Supreme Court justices or anybody else, and legislators. So that's the capitalist angle plus the masculinist angle. 
where men are not allowed to be vulnerable and scared and upset and reach out and look for comfort outside of a sexual context, but hug each other and cry and so on. Women have that option. We've been given the permission as inferiors to have emotions and they come in handy. And so our protection is much more from connecting with other people than shooting them. But, you know, this is a, a national disgrace. You know, originally Mother's Day was women from opposing sides getting together saying we are against killing. Then it became candy, flowers, and selling. Right, right. Let's talk about the Pew Charitable Trust. You just read a new, mm-hmm. read about a new survey that shows how truly a uh, tr- how unfree mm-hmm. we are. That the right. that, that how the government mm-hmm. does not work for us. That's right. That's right. And there is no class platform. No explicit class platform that says the people of America are getting screwed. You know, uh, in 1980s, you could only inherit $600,000 from your parents to give people not a fair start, but a less horrendously unequal start. Now, you can inherit $25 million. If there's only one parent, only 12 and a half million. Our country has changed. Income has moved up. And there's a yawning gap between the mass of people and the top that owns a half of our country, the top three billionaires. And there is no party to represent us. And we need that. We need that class-oriented party that unites all of us. Mm -hmm. Climate, sexuality, and Black Lives Matter, and legal rights, all of it, together. And that's what they have in France, which under Mélenchon, because they're much more class-conscious, and that's why they have four million people in the street protesting, right. raising the pension age. But right. <laughs> we desperately need that. So people are are given alternatives that are neither of them addresses the class issue explicitly. That what we have as a mass of people is we make everything happen. If we stop, it doesn't happen. What they have is the money. We have to stand together. That's what we have, each other. Right, right. Which is totally crucial and missing right now in the United States. It was there in the Socialist Party at the turn of the century in the early 1900s. But the McCarthy anti-communist, anti-socialist, anti-left purges just very successfully crushed that movement. Right. And Occupy tried to bring it back and was very successful with their 1%, 99%. But Obama closed them all down on the same day. How do, people, how do people contact you? Well, they could contact me through my website, harrietfraud.com or hfraud at gmail.com. And I should say that as a therapist... I certainly see that economics and politics affect and shape us and interact and constantly are molded by and mold are also personal issues and our family issues and our race issues. But they're all they all shape one another. And you can't elide the whole social and political sphere that impacts our lives. You know, you think about that one in 14 people who's had homelessness. That's not just in your head. Homelessness. It's not, ju- it's not just in your head. Right. Which, which is the name of your podcast. You host with, it with? With Liam Tate and Ikoi Hero. Because, of course, it's not just in your head that you're evicted. 
or that right. you're constantly frightened. Then in New York, Mayor Adams has now in, allowed rents to increase, even in rent control. I am proud of us, though, that CUNY's law school graduation had Adams as a speaker. And when he stood up to speak, most of the graduating lawyers turned their backs and booed because he wants to cut the funds to, to CUNY and raise the prices, the one chance people get. Right. So that class consciousness is totally important and having a slate of candidates that represent the working class, the mass of us who are really getting shafted, about 80 percent. Dr. Harriet Fraud, we'll see you next week, I hope. I hope so. Yes, indeed. OK, thank you, thank you Dr. Fraud. Good night. Good night. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn is joining us. He is the author of Paid to Piss People Off, published by Blue Cedar Press. Go buy this book. It has the Feldman Guarantee. It's a trilogy. And we talked porn tonight. We're talking prayer. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. He's also a lawyer and a member of the Supreme Court Bar and has dedicated his life to keeping religion out of the public square. For nearly a quarter of a century, he ran Americans United for separation of church and state. One of your three books is entitled Prayer. What does prayer mean? What is the definition of prayer? Well, many definitions exist, but I, to me, a prayer is an effort to either be thankful for some higher power or to ask for some higher powers intervention in your life for good or for ill. A couple of weeks ago when this came up, I talked about imprecatory prayers, which are in the Christian Bible, and they are prayers uttered for the death or debilitating illness of an enemy. How about like, OK, is it? I was going to ask, is it wrong to pray that Donald Trump has acid reflux? But let me. No, you, you could do that. I actually, the last couple of days, have had severe acid reflux myself. So somebody could be out there. You could. Let me posit this. You know, I like science fiction. <laughs> Let's say that this broadcast was heard not five years from now on some other planet, it has already been heard a week ago in some other astral plane, some other universe in this multiverse. And they heard this and they said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to treat Lynn with acid <laughs> reflux. It's a great, you know, it's a Great theory. I've, I've yeah. been fascinated by multiverses, but let's get back to prayer. All right. So what do you say to somebody who has a life that's better than how many? Are there eight billion people on the planet or six? I think there's six. OK. But who's counting? So is it fair to say that I'm living better than five billion people on the planet? Right. So for me to ask something for myself as opposed to for uh, for others. Uh, it feels uncomfortable asking for something. Right. Yes, it does. And so, that's why, well, some of us think that the best prayers are prayers that whether they have any effect or not, of course, is another subject. I'm sure many of their, uh, our, our viewers here would say that it does not. And there's plenty of evidence that it doesn't. However, if you are trying to make a statement, it is probably better to pray to whatever entity God may be, if God exists, that that blessing should be accorded to people who have far less than anybody who's possibly listening to the David Feldman show, including you, okay. myself, and all the people. In now, the we, in, in all seriousness, we have talked about yep. you helping me form a religion. Right. So I never have to pay taxes. Right. In my religion, and I'm being absolutely serious, we would have, sure. a, we would have a prayer exchange. 
Yes. Where I would agree to pray that you become a multimillionaire if yeah. you would agree to pray that I become a multimillionaire or I pray that you get a Mercedes for Christmas if you pray that I get a trip to Hawaii and we would have like a prayer exchange. That's right. And we would swap. And this way you're always praying for somebody else. <laughs> With a footnote. With a footnote. Foot, the asterisk says, by the way, I understand that you'll be praying for something worth at least as much for me. Right. Yeah, it's a good it's a good theory. I think there are, you know, there are TV preachers out there that um, are so-called uh, prosperity gospel preachers. These are the people who say, pray for wealth because wealth is something God can give you. And as a, a famous uh, preacher in the Washington, D.C. area said, he said, do not get on your knees and pray because it makes it possible for easier for people to kick you in the behind. So stand up and pray and pray that you want wealth. Right. And, and, and that that's a, kind of a, a probably not a good thing. But anything you say, any preposterous claim you make is going to be allowed under the guise of religion and the courts will recognize it in the unlikely event that the United States Supreme Court in a few months comes down with a ruling against that postal worker who wants to have all of his Sundays off completely because the whole day, he says, is the Lord's Day. If the court looks at this and says, well, normally we would say any Christian idea, we're going to say it trumps any other policy, but because there are corporations at stake here, mm -hmm. not just the Postal Service, if they rule for the Postal Service, I think it's just a, a significant statement from the court that they do in fact care about one thing more than Christians, and that is corporate America. And so in your book, Prayer, why did you yeah. write specifically about prayer? Do you think you people know, are praying incorrectly? No, it, it's actually mainly about efforts by the government to remind us of the prayers we ought to be praying. There is something called the National Day of Prayer. It occurs in, in April. It's a private event, but it's it's been declared as a uh, National Day of Prayer was declared by Congress, I think, as a uh, kind of a favor to uh, the late Reverend Billy Graham. And I never understood what exactly you were supposed to do on National Day of Prayer. Uh, are you supposed to pray louder that day or longer? Or maybe in the last administrations, uh, pray in English, but not Spanish. I mean, what is it that you're supposed to do? And I remember being on a show with um, uh, Megan Kelly uh, when she was still on Fox. And we were discussing this, and she said that she didn't understand how anybody could be against National Day of Prayer. And she said, um, in fact, Mr. Lim, why do you even think prayer is religious? And uh, I smiled. And uh, when I went back to my office and looked up comments on it, it appeared that um, uh, this was declared by um, Media Matters, the the dumbest thing said by a conservative that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, but so you if know, you said to these people. Yeah. Yeah. Pr I believe prayer is like freedom of speech. Not all prayer should be protected. Some prayer can be dangerous. Would they get on board? Could you get the conservatives to agree that certain types of prayer can be no. could hurt society? No, I could never, I could never achieve that. Would they because, agree? Would they agree? W would well, see. It, um, I apologize if I've told this story before, but for some reason I've been telling a lot of stories in a lot of places in the last couple of weeks. There was a um, an effort by someone that both of us know, Mikey Weinstein, mm -hmm. who runs a, a kind of a religion focused in the military organization and um, keeping the keeping religion keeping religion out of, out of the military yeah. and keeping it out in inappropriate ways and um, he and i were both being 
prayed against and he wanted me to join a civil lawsuit against the guy that was praying for the death of both of us in Texas. And it was a clever idea because he really wanted, although it never quite got to, to this point, but he wanted to be able to ask or have his lawyer ask uh, the guy praying for our death, whether he meant it. And then if the guy suggested that, well, he, he, he did it, but he didn't know if it would work. So then he, then Mikey would say, so in other words, prayer doesn't always work. I mean, right. it's very clever, but as I often say, so many good things that might happen in a court are clever, too clever by half, right. and they just never work out. Mikey Weinstein served in the Bush administration, the first Yeah, Bush he was in the White House. Yeah. He was in the White yeah. House. He was a very conservative guy. I think he's still a pretty conservative guy, but not on this issue. Or There's something- you, can be, you can be conservative wanting to conserve the separation of church and Absolutely. state. Absolutely. That's a it's a very conservative principle, and it, and it's very biblical principle too, because Jesus in one of the gospels, in the first Christian gospel, actually says to her his followers, um, "Do not pray in public like the hypocrites. Go into a closet and pray to your Father." And that's when you will be benefiting from prayer. So he says this public prayer baloney, don't do it. Don't do it. He's also the guy to be, you know, biblically correct, who said, render unto Caesar those things that are Caesar, like pay your taxes, but Mm -hmm. unto God those things that are God's, as in spiritual. So you're saying Jesus said to pray in the closet. But yeah. there's so many Republicans in the closet, there's no room, so they have to go pray yeah, that, in the public that, square. That's absolutely true. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the strangest thing. And worse, there seem to be a lot of people who are not in the closet, or they may be in the closet, we really don't know, but who, who have been mightily involved in all kinds of despicable things, as opposed to just being in the closet as a closeted gay person. But they take a step and, and become abusive to young people or children. Right. Now, Pretty ha- horrible stuff. Have they ever tested prayer? You, yes, t- they you, have. You touched on this. Did they t- have they? Yeah, they. No, they and and, they and can you t- taste test Christian prayer versus Islamic prayers and Jewish prayers? Yeah, it's see- really hard to set up that kind of a system. Well, why but, don't but we no, do that? No, but it has been done. They, they take samples. They take people who are proficient at praying and who believe the, in the efficacy of prayer <laughs> and they pray for people. And then they take another group who just kind of says nice things about people and statistically there is no difference that doesn't mean you know that doesn't mean it it means scientifically there's no evidence that prayer works it doesn't mean that if you if you pray for something it's not going to happen but it's not a good and scientifically how do you know if people are really praying how do you know if they really believe it i've heard so many television preachers who pray for things and i know positively know that they don't believe it themselves. So their prayers are worthless. Why don't we sell this as a show to Netflix <laughs> where you you take three yep. terminally, three, five terminally ill people. Yep. yep. And each one of them is assigned a different religious leader and a placebo, right. yes. unfortunately. Yep. And we tell them, we don't tell them which religion is praying for you. Right. And in six months, we we get, you know, their white blood cell counts and see if yep. they've gone up or down and how they're doing. And we see if the placebo did better than the actual prayers. It's a good thing. I don't know if Netflix is the place to sell it, but Jerry Springer, of course, who uh, did s- some similar things. Uh, he's he's leaving television. Whoever syndicates his show would, I think, be very open to this kind of program. Well, maybe the death, but maybe terminally ill is a downer. Maybe it could be a dating show. Maybe it can be five <laughs> lonely men yeah. who are praying to get laid. Yeah. And you have a religious leader and a placebo yep. praying for each individual man. And each week we test, we ask, how, how did, did you get laid? No. Yeah. Okay. So that's, 
So they did That's test good. prayer. They, they, they tested it and yes. they can't prove that it works. Yeah, there is no evidence that it works. And yet, and yet, centur- for centuries, people still people prayed. They still pray. Yes. But how again, do you explain that? Well, because, because there are certain circumstances under which people, knowing that they're being prayed for, do apparently feel better, get better. Things happen to them that are good, and then they ascribe it to prayer. And I would am I not going to say they didn't get anything. I just think that if you want to look at this through a scientific lens, there's no evidence that it works. So you do pray. I do pray. Do you find God in other people or do you find it in nature? Where do you, if I may ask, where, where do you find God? Uh, this is actually uh, a question. My one and only appearance with John's, uh, with uh, Colbert, with Colbert, was about the issue of prayer. And I said, "Look, I don't think." He said, "Barry, do you do you feel uncomfortable? We're here in the choir loft of a of a church in Greenwich Village. Do you feel odd talking about why?" You don't agree with the posting of the Ten Commandments, which many people construe as a kind of a prayer. You could turn it into a prayer. I said, no. I said, I just, I think to the extent that God exists and he exists everywhere. And Colbert says, he stops the interview and he says, well, let's work with this a minute. That's when I actually was aware that I was the good guy, not the bad guy in in the episode. And he said, Let, let's think about this. He's so you go, Barry, is, um, is God in a multiplex? <laughs> I said, yes, I, I believe God is in a multiplex. And he said, okay, then and I said, we have to work on this some more. Okay, what's a really bad movie? I said, how about Hudson Hawk? That was the Bruce Willis terrible movie where he's a cat burglar. I, I said, how about Hudson Hawk? He says, okay. Okay, so Barry, if God's in a cinema uh, why do you even permit them to make Hudson Hawk? <laughs> I said, <laughs> you know, and he, how about the, uh, how about the Grammys? I, is he there? I said, I don't think so. And he said, well, but I'm sure he is because every time somebody wins a Grammy, the first thing they do is thank God. And then somebody else like their producer. Right. And then he said, well, how about the Emmys? I said, not sure that he wants to pick Emmys winners either. Dan Colbert stops the interview again. He goes, let's do this twice. Say he doesn't care. I said, I didn't care about the Emmys. And then Colbert goes, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure he does because we just won one <laughs> last week. And then we also did one where he says, well, of course, he's not interested in the Emmys with that had they lost, but they actually right. won. So I guess, you know. What does that prove? What percentage of the people who wear it on their sleeve actually believe it? What do you think? I think a bare majority of people who wear religion on their sleeve uh, do, in fact, believe it. I think when you as you get up in the hierarchy of most religious entities, you find fewer and fewer people who actually believe it. Does religion give you... A, a, a dangerous certitude. I was reading a review of a new book about Dr. King. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he would say is, if I'm wrong, God is wrong. If I'm wrong, the yeah. Constitution is wrong. If I'm wrong, God is wrong. And I was talking tonight about immigration and the refugees and... Yep. Welcoming, welcoming them. And I sure. said to quote Dr. King, if I'm wrong, then God is wrong. And I meant that. I have absolute certitude sure. when I said that. Is that dangerous to talk that way? I think it often is dangerous to talk that way. I've heard that Dr. King said that. And I, I was a, the first time I heard it, I was quite surprised because I didn't think that he would ascribe everything he said 
to the precise meaning of what God wanted. He was generally very careful. I think in that statement, he was perhaps not so careful. I think and he was, the, the but I, was th I think he was taught, I'm not sure, but I think yeah. he said it in the 50s and it was after the church bombings with the four that, girls. That could be, yeah, the four little girls. And um, I mean, it, if he, God, well, any, I mean, how could you not agree with that? Well, yeah, in a specific instance, uh, yeah. of course, but I, but I think to go and take it from specific to the generalization that everything you do because you are a religious person means God's on your side, which, of course, everybody, including Bob Dylan, knows that if God's on the side of any one country, then why isn't God smart enough to stop the next war in the first right. place? So, yeah, I think it's a very dangerous idea to think that because you are trained as a minister, because you are a member of a certain kind of church, that therefore your word is so important that it's more important than anybody else, and that it's obvious that you're speaking for God and other people are not. The, the role that religion plays in government, I think, should be uh, to stay out of government, but to remind people of the absolutes of the teachings of Jesus, which say, which say the meek shall inherit the earth, take care of the poor, take care of the poor, take care of the poor, and government should say, you don't know how difficult it is to take care of the poor, but we're trying. But that's it. To, to try to create a standard upon which government tries to live up to. Not to not to give cover, sure. not to give cover to the government, to, to be pure and say you're you're not following the teachings of Christ. Yes, that would be wonderful. That could be part of the Church of Feldman. I but just want to make not, money. I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I don't that. want to pay taxes. I, there, but I, was, I was trying to elevate this no, discussion. No, 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 to no, try no. To turn, so there are people who have heard this for, what, three years we've been talking about this. you forming a church. It's so simple. You have to write a letter. I would write the letter for you. What is that for three years? What is funnier than the Church of Feldman? Just the name alone, the Church <laughs> it, it's of Feldman. Re, it, it's really quite funny. Yeah, <laughs> we, yeah could, we could. We can make, can, I could could, say, we can make. Here's what you can do. You know the same, the same show we were talking about before, the one where you pray. You know, maybe n not f for people in terminal conditions, but pray for something else an improvement in their love life. We can also have it sponsored by the Church of Feldman. So you can go to a network with a package and you can say, not only do I have a great idea, but I've got support for that idea from a nonprofit entity. What about... That's a double whammy. If you can't sell that, you know, you can't sell anything. What about indulgence bucks where you pay me for indulgences yeah. like, yeah. hey, my sister's uh, my wife's sister is really cute. Yeah, <laughs> I'd like to take her to the movies. Yeah, that's 50 bucks. You need an, ind uh, an indulgence buck. Yeah. And I it's, mail uh, you an indulgence to go take your absolutely. wife's sister out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's, a, a hall pass. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you could do that. David, you can do anything you want. You set up this religion. On a show the other night, somebody was talking about guns, guns in the Bible. And, and uh, you know, he said, well, there's no reference to guns in the Bible. And there's no. And I said, yeah, but you don't you don't know how much some of these Christian nationalists, how deeply into the Bible they go. This is a true story. Some years ago, there was a service held in a church, a Christian church in Western Pennsylvania that did two things. You were supposed to come to uh, renew your wedding vows and simultaneously in the same service, bless your automatic weapons. Really, this is this is the kind of thing where you have to say, and I am not making this up. 
and I am not making it up. So you can you can get people on the fringes to pray for anything, to do anything, and they're all tax exempt well, we, organizations. Professor Adnan Hussein was teaching the Crusades. This is not something new. I mean, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. This goes back. I'm pretty the, sure that that was actually not what was said during the Crusades, but I get your point. But it, it was immediate. Christianity was immediately co-opted by the state to justify war the same way all religions are used, are twisted and turned upside down and yeah. used for the opposite of why they were. Well, it's true. And, you know, there's a, a guy I knew, uh, Martin Marty, did a whole series of books, I think eight books on fundamentalism in every religion. And people forget that there are fundamentalist Hindus, there are even fundamentalist Buddhists, which sounds like uh, you couldn't exist, but they are, and they have very bizarre views, which are not that much different than the most bizarre views of Christian nationalists or... Uh, now, fundament... Uh, Fundament Fund yep. at the time of Rabelais meant shit. It did. I, it I did not. No, I didn't know that because I, I, I can't speak French. But but is there? I don't even like French food. <laughs> it tastes like what? shit. But is fun, yeah. is is fundament and fundamentalist? Is do you think it's? I, I wonder no. what the relationship yeah, is. Yeah, I don't think there is any. Really, I don't think there is any. But I'm sure. Somebody in the chat area uh, could tell us if they found the link that we are unable to find here. You you say prayer doesn't work. I'm saying scientific evidence for the success of prayers does not exist. That's a slightly different viewpoint. Okay, we have a question from Brian. Okay. Can you please ask the Reverend if he thinks Buddhism is possibly the least violent religion? I think it probably is the least violent religion. I don't think that, that that doesn't protect them from having certain fundamentalist ideas, but the fundamentalist ideas do not relate in general to murdering people who aren't Buddhists, for example. Right. I'm looking up the Tamil Tigers. I, I apologize. Yeah, I don't. I, I do know that there have been... Uh, I think in, uh, there's been some, vi I don't know if the, it's the t Tamil, t there, but there have been Buddhist, violent Buddhists, right? I don't know if the Tamil Tigers were Buddhists. The Detroit Tigers. Oh, they, yeah, they were. They were Jewish yeah, they were. with Hank Greenberg. They converted exactly, to Exactly, Hank Greenberg. Yeah, he, he was the, uh, wasn't he a spy for the... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in our limited, so, uh, let me turn well, off yeah. Dave Cyrus there for a second. All right. He's joining they us. They were Hindus. They were Hindus. The Tamil Tigers. And, and the Thuggies were uh, a sectarian movement within Hinduism that did, in fact, attack travelers on the roads. They were not nice people. And this is the point that, that Martin Marty was trying to make by writing all these books about the fundamentalist tendencies way beyond those within Christianity, which, of course, appalled him. Right. In addition, we've been talking with the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. He is the author of Paid to Piss People Off. It's published by Blue Cedar Press. Go buy this over at Blue Cedar Press's website or go to BarryWLynn.com. Go to Barnes and Noble or check out Amazon. Buy it. I compel you. The power of Bezos compels you to go to Amazon. And purchase paid to piss people off. Has a prayer ever worked for you? Uh, I do believe that prayers have worked for me. I, as some people know, within a matter of three weeks of... Uh, of retirement, uh, I had a near fatal heart problem. That was my and prayer for you. That was your prayer. <laughs> that was my impregnatory. It worked. I was saying, what I was saying, <laughs> I said, I was saying, I, I could, 
I told an atheist convention that I spoke to shortly after I nearly died. I said, look, I don't want to make this just about me, but I can guarantee you I didn't see any circle of bright light coming through a tunnel. I didn't see relatives recently deceased. I didn't see David Bowie coming at me. So it may just be you die and nothing happens. That was my experience. But again, I didn't die. And I did think of a lot of funny things and I put them up on Facebook and uh, many people saw them and they said, if you're so sick, how can you post these silly little pictures every single day? Yeah, hmm. I just wanted to mention that. All right. Go buy Paid to Piss People Off, published by Blue Cedar Press. It has the Feldman guarantee. If this book, if these three books do not stimulate every part of your body, including your mind, I will reimburse you. What's the next book we talk about? I think we should talk about peace. That's the first of the books. Okay. This talks about amnesty for war resistors, for efforts to stop um, uh, what I consider the militarization of the country by f starting draft registration up again. And uh, with any luck, I'll even be over laryngitis by the time we talk about oh, it. Oh, I didn't, I, I, I didn't even notice. Oh, really? Well, yeah. I do. I definitely have. Follow it's the worse. Reverend... Follow the Reverend on Twitter at Barry W. Lim. I'll see you next week. Stay out of trouble, Reverend. Only good trouble for me. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. 